So just to, to kind of summarize it, mm-hmm. it's best I'm understanding. So one, you have a Marxist orientation. You go through black power uh, with all of its obvious appeals, uh, mm-hmm. particularly at that time. Yeah. And then to a 20 year old too. What'd you say? Uh, and to a 19 and 20 year old too. Right. But, absolutely. And then you have this, you, you see the internal contradictions. Then you see um, the ways, if I'm understanding you, in which like the aesthetics of radicalism can easily migrate to, okay. you know, conservative Democratic Party politics in Atlanta right. in the 70s. So that, right. you know, a historical example we've talked about is like, maybe Baird Rustin seems really boring in the mm-hmm. 60s. And then you realize Actually, him and A. Philip Randolph are, in addition to fighting American apartheid and Jim Crow, they're talking about labor demands and right. social provisions that it can't just be delivered um, by some kind of, you know, uh, you know, HR, you know, some sort of corporate back patronage right. machine. Right. Um, but, you know, that same machine, while, while keeping forward the same core economic policies can you know, wear different clothes and signify different things. And, 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 and look, maybe, you know, I, I'm not, maybe there's some value to that. Maybe there isn't, but that is not structural and economic. So then you, no, you go right. through there and then you, and then if, and then if I'm understanding you correctly, and this is where I think your work is so illustrative because right now I think, I mean, we are just bombarded by essentialist narratives of any sort. Yeah. That you of every sort, but you you kind of point out in your work that like some of the response to a, a, a class based and also racist tract like the bell curve, mm-hmm. that some of that response doesn't go into interrogating the very work of trying to creating the, those subcategories of humans to build descriptive hierarchies to right. justify a particularly predatory form of capitalism, which is how I read that book, that it, it instead of trying to skip that and interrogate the map, it just builds a counter map. Right. Yeah. Answer that. That's right. right. That's right. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Uh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And, and the fundamental problem with that stuff is it's ontological, but even before being ontological, it's, it's idealist. Right. Um, and Can you I mean, explain that, that to people? I think that's really important. Yeah, uh, I mean, um, idealism is a philosophical orientation that presumes that ideas are real things um, and have a real force and can do things in, in the world uh, and that they have essences, ultimately, and the essences can be realized in, in, in the world. Uh, so, for instance, I mean, one of uh, the things that always kind of tickles me about uh, you know, late Victorian and, um, and Edwardian race science, right, is that um, the race theorists uh, spent a lot of time constructing um, ideal taxonomies, right? Like the, what the quintessential type of the Teuton was or like the lower Galatian or whatever the fuck, right? <clears throat> right, because at this time there were like as as many as 36 different races inside Europe, depending on who's counting. <clears throat> and they, they were so fixated on trying to get these exact taxonomies, right, to identify like the pure Nordic type or the pure Gallic type or whatever, which, which was always only and intellectual abstraction from, from, from taxonomic characteristics that they fucking made up, right? So, right, right. Uh, so I mean, there's always like, yeah, well, who says like a Nordic has a high Baltic forehead or whatever, right? And what the fuck does that even mean? <laughs> and, and then what they did was they went out to measure actually existing populations according to their approximation to or distance from the ideal type of, uh, of that geographic area, right? When all of it was just pure, made up, okie doke bullshit, right? But they were absolutely convinced it was scientific. And the cool thing about it, for me anyway, from a teaching point of view, 
is that the harder they tried to specify it scientifically, the more they exposed that they couldn't, mm. right? Uh, because you just can't. Like, 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 um, you know, all these classificatory systems are totally arbitrary, right? Um, and as always, like the who says. So anyway, I mean, so I think now fast forward, I guess, to like the 1980s um, and the emergence of what was called identity politics. What, what you see is that essentialism takes the form, well, it takes a couple of different forms. The first um, variant is the naive one, right? It's like you posit a population category and you impute um, a way of thinking, uh, values, right, whatever, to it. Okay, so so blacks are X. All right, so so that implies that there's something essential uh, about being black that lives in inside the person, right? Like it's there, what, whether or not you you want it, right? So I mean. And I mean, going back to the beginning of the 20th century or like the end of the 19th century, that's where, you know, that's the sort of scientific logic, uh, you know, underneath the figure of the tragic mulatto, right? Because what's tragic is the mulatto looks like he or she is white, but has this essence that keeps them ever from being truly white, right? All right. So that's like, garden variety, race essentialism. And you can do the same thing with gender, right? Or, or I mean, whatever else. Uh, and then, um, I guess by the mid, mid 90s, probably, um, as, as, as the identities began to proliferate, um, then people started saying, well, but wait, I'm a man, but I'm also black. Or really, no, to be more honest, it's I'm a woman because it's like the privileged identities. And I'm also black. So like my blackness makes me different from white women and my womanness makes me different from black men. And I know there's a cut of the black studies budget and a cut of the women's studies budget that I should have access to because that's where all this stuff lives, right? Right, I'm at the political economy of racial, rep of ra racial or gender re representation. Um, and so ironically, um, you know, the, the notion of intersectionality comes into existence and I can't see people typing on the side now, but I'm sure that shit's going crazy. Um, that, um, as we have the best people Adolf and they're very smart and they do a tremendous job, frankly. So yeah. Okay. You better talk about my audience. Like it's Trump talking about his people. Right. Uh, well, oh yeah, yeah. totally. Right, I take <laughs> yeah, that back. So they're great people, noticed, and they do a great job. Right. Oh, totally, yeah, totally. Yeah. I didn't notice the moment where where what one of them discovered that Ture has a three door closet in his basement. But but uh, <laughs> and and that was side chatter for for for, for about two or three minutes. Right. <laughs> but then the squirrel ran ran past, and their attention changed. But anyway. Right. <laughs> okay uh, they have no attention spans now hit intersectionality go for it um, <laughs> build some more bridges <laughs> right 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 exactly <laughs> <laughs> so the irony of the intersectionality thing is that it came into existence as a way to solve the problem that the big essentialized identities were like two big and too capacious and didn't capture enough discrete experiences. <clears throat> but what they did, but what intersectionality does, does in, instead is uh, instead of dissolving the problem or resolving the problem of essentialism by dissolving the, the essentializing categories, um, it increases them, right? It's like, Efficient, right? So it increases. So, so there are more. So there's a special perspective of a black woman. There's a special perspective of a gay black woman, right? And goes on and on and on. Um, ironically, a few years earlier, something similar had happened uh, around the mixed race notion, right? Because a lot of people who were advocating mixed mixed race and 
And what I got from, from a reliable source on this uh, is that uh, who attended what she described as uh, the Million Mulatto March, like in DC, which was actually a couple hundred people, um, was like white mothers of, of mixed race kids who wanted to have some, some separate uh, identity for them. And, you know, why not? Like, if that's a game you're playing, <clears throat> um, you know, I mean, I can't beef about it. But ironically, well, people understood, a lot of people understood the mixed race category as a way to jump out of the racial binaries. It, it actually just produced more uh, discrete and sharply defined racial categories. So, all right. So, I mean, that's the intersectionality thing. Um, in the just academy, to be, I just want to be clear too, yeah. and that the critique, and it's interesting because it has nothing to do with, and this is something that at least I've been sort of banging on and, and is definitely elemental to your work and to our work, to Ray's work that it has, this is a separate trajectory from the idea and the project of, um, making sure basically that everybody has legal and civic equity. Right. in a political society or a democracy, right. that there's no discrimination right. in terms of housing, employment, voting, public assembly, or anything else. Right. That That is one trajectory. But then on the other hand, that instead of um, looking at these ascriptive hierarchies, recognizing their origins and where they're coming from, and trying to unsettle them, you end up reifying them in a more and more and more precision and replication. Right. Yeah, I think that's okay. right. Yeah, okay. yeah, I think that's right. And I mean, in the academy, it became like an issue in the 90s because of the premise that to be able to study the X, you got to be an X, right. right? And my first reaction to that is, well, like I'm interested in the 19th century. I don't got a time machine. So um, how can I do that? <laughs> Right. Right. Because right. it's the same principle. Right. 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 And it's fundamentally anti intellectual. Right. right. Uh, and I mean, this was also the moment when people like, um, you know, really got 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 fat off of ragging on the Enlightenment. And, you know, I've always been kind of an Enlightenment sort of guy. Right. At least some 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 pieces of it. Right. Like a lot of pieces of it, actually. Um, like um, you know, the objection to uh, clerical authority, uh, right, right, no matter what the cleric is, right? Uh, and um, but people often enough would like hear that and you know bristle, right? But when I'd say, yeah, well, I, I think the Enlightenment is pretty good. I mean, I remember when I gave my job job talk at the New School. One of my colleagues, he's a great guy actually, but. Um, um, Asked, asked me at one point in the Q and A. Um, he first uh, remarked and said, "Wow, like you, this, there's some ways in which you sound like a really like you know, a statist liberal." Um, and he said, "So why why is it that you are so committed to the state?" And I think he was looking for something that you know was Locke or Rousseau or whatever, or I mean, even Marx. But I just said to him. Well, because I want to make sure that the people who live on the other side of the hill can't come and eat me, right? <laughs> and I think that's one reason that we need to stay, right? And I think the Enlightenment was like that too, right? Like you can't, and when the idea, see, I mean, I mean, I sometimes joke that post toastyism of whatever sort is like um, demonic, right? Because this idea that I, I have my truth and you have your truth. And as Walter Ben, ben Michaels argues, you know, splendidly in the shape of the signifier, what that means is it is a disagreement is no longer, what well, no, is there's no, no, no more space, space for argument, right? There's difference, there's no space, um, I mean, there's no space, space for disagreement. Um, and that's like the, you know, like the end of, and believe me, I, I can't believe that I was almost tempted. That, that's like the end of society, right? Like I was almost tempted to say the end of civil society, which is a phrase 
that I've never uttered in my life, you know, without contempt. And, and I think I just saved myself from doing it then. But you, and you know what I mean, right? Thank you. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.